In American politics, few ideas stir as much conflict and turmoil as the phrase, separation of church and state. Where did this phrase originate? And was the original intent to prohibit religious expression in the political arena? Or does the phrase separation of church and state now mean something it was never intended? Do we have, as many historians claim, a godless constitution? Discover the forgotten and astonishing story of our nation's foundation in the American Heritage series. For centuries, Americans were taught a truthful view of history that recognized the godly heroes and moral foundation our nation was founded upon. But in recent years, a new version of history has assaulted the moral and spiritual fiber of our nation, leaving the truth of our past eliminated and forgotten until today. Join historian David Barton and experience the untold story of our nation's history in the American Heritage Series. In modern politics, the term separation of church and state is most commonly used to ban acts of faith in the public arena. But a closer look into history reveals the intentions of this phrase to be just the opposite. How then has our history been redefined and rewritten? Discover our nation's godly history in the American Heritage Series. America, this is your heritage. Separation of church and state is a phrase that we've had in American history for 400 years. But in the last 50 years, the court has interpreted it in such a way that it now causes the First Amendment to violate itself, amazingly. We have two clauses to the First Amendment. One guarantees the free exercise of religion so that we can freely express our religious faith. And the second prohibits the establishment of a national church. Right. Well, the court now says, you know, if you exercise your religious faith, if you pray at a graduation, if you pray at a football game, if you pray at a city council meeting, you're unconstitutionally establishing religion. So what we've got now is if you do part of the First Amendment, you're violating the other part of the First Amendment. That is a really wacky interpretation. And when did that change? Dave? Well, it changed in 1947 when the Supreme Court decided that instead of using the language of the First Amendment, they're going to use the phrase separation church and state to interpret the First Amendment. So that became the language of the First Amendment in their opinion, which is not necessarily bad. I mean, we use phrases to interpret constitutional clauses. But what they did, the phrase that had been given, had been given specifically to say the free exercise clause is not to be touched by government. In other words, there's separation church and state, and that will keep the government from stopping your free exercise of religion. 1947, the court says, we think separation church and state goes better with the establishment clause. Mm -hmm. In other words, what we're going to tell you is that because of separation church and state, you can't have the free exercise of religion in a public arena. Now, you can at home, you can at church. You can do free exercise of religion all day long if it's private, but don't try to get public with this. Mm -hmm. If your free exercise of religion gets public, then you've violated the separation of church and state. For just short of two centuries, the First Amendment had prohibited the federal government from halting public religious exercises. But now, somehow, the First Amendment means just the opposite all because the court took an eight-word phrase from a private letter and twisted and completely reversed its meaning and then made that phrase a replacement for the clear wording of the Constitution. That 1962 case redefined the First Amendment and it's notable for other reasons as well, particularly for its use, or lack thereof, of precedence. Recall that when the 1892 Supreme Court unanimously ruled that Christian principles must remain the basis of American laws and institutions, it had offered nearly 80 precedents as a basis for that decision. The 1962 case was just the opposite, providing virtually no precedents to support its removal of voluntary school prayer. The justices on the court were simply ready to move America in a new direction. So in essence, they simply announced, we'll not have voluntary prayer in schools anymore. We now think that that violates the Constitution. Within 12 months of that original decision, in two additional cases, the court reaffirmed its removal of voluntary prayer and then broadened its prohibition to include Bible reading at school. This was an even more radical reversal than the removal of voluntary prayer. How do they get by with chaplains that pray before sessions of Congress, yeah. before senator, you know, I mean, how, how, how does know, that it's work? It's infuriating. <laughs> what happens is 
the very guys who wrote the Constitution, followed by the guys who wrote the First Amendment, are the guys who said, oh, we need to pay for religion. Religious expression is so important. Free exercise of religion is so important. We're going to put federal funds into making sure it occurs. So here they are saying, we're going to fund a House and a Senate chaplain. And by the way, those House and Senate chaplains were funded not to open every session of Congress with prayer. That was only half their duties. The descriptions of chaplains at that point had dual duties. One is they open the House and the Senate with prayer on a daily basis, which they still do today. The second part of their original responsibilities were they were supposed to preach divine service or Sunday sermons every Sunday at the U.S. Capitol. So what we did was we hired chaplains to preach at the capital of the United States? We're preaching at the capital? What about separation of church and state? Exactly. Separation of church and state is to guarantee that you can have those public religious expressions. The U.S. Congress, same guys who wrote the Constitution and First Amendment, put money into paying chaplains not only to pray for them when they open, but also to preach sermons to them every Sunday in government buildings. Now, that's original intent. That's what was designed. That tells you what separation church and state meant. And by the way, the, the American that's credited with giving us that phrase separation church and state in the constitutional era is President Thomas Jefferson. So President Thomas Jefferson responding to a letter that he had received from a group of Baptists saying we're concerned that the government might stop our religious activities. He said, no, nah, it's not going to happen. Separation church and state, they're not going to stop your activities. He wrote that letter on Friday. January the 1st, 1802. That, that's where you find his separation of church and state phrase. Now, and by the way, that, that original letter is in the possession of the U.S. government. It's at the Library of Congress. And Jefferson, when he wrote that letter, there's a lengthy section where he took that little quill pen, all that ink, he wiped out a whole bunch of lines, just completely scribbled through them so you couldn't read what was there. So what, what's wiped out and what's replaced with that simple little phrase reasserts what he was saying. So. Jefferson wrote that letter on Friday, January the 1st, 1802. On Sunday, January the 3rd, 1802, Thomas Jefferson went to the U.S. Capitol to church at the U.S. Capitol to hear his friend, the Reverend John Leland, preach the service at the U.S. Capitol. So what you got is on Friday, he writes separation church and state, and on Sunday, he's in church at the U.S. Capitol? Doesn't he understand his letter? Yes, he understands it. His letter says the government's not going to stop religious activities. So this thing about paid chaplains, we've had that since the very beginning, and that was part of the proof that separation of church and state was to keep the government from stopping those activities. In modern politics, the term separation of church and state is most commonly used to ban acts of faith in the public arena. But a closer look into history reveals the intentions of this phrase to be just the opposite. How then has our history been redefined and rewritten? Discover our nation's godly history in the American Heritage Series. America, this is your heritage. Military chaplains have been the subject of a lot of attention recently. Um, there have been a number of, of instances. I, I, I speak at a lot of military bases all over the world, and I have had for years chaplains coming up to me and saying, you know, we are now required to write our prayers out before we pray them. We have to turn them in in advance, and we have to let the JAG attorneys go over them and edit our prayers before we pray them. Oh, no. We're gonna, whoa, 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 time out. That is certainly not the business of government to get into what you're praying and what you're saying. But this has been going on for years. Uh, it's been an issue in Congress, a lot of legislation trying to, to solve this issue. Uh, we actually have had chaplains who have been disciplined and demoted for using the wrong words when they prayed their prayers. Now, we have all sorts of faiths in the, in the military chaplain corps. And we got Muslims, we got Buddhists, we have Wiccans, we have Christians, we have Jews. It's not the business of government to tell any one of them how to pray. Right. I may disagree with some of their prayers. That's fine. It's not my business to tell you how to pray, and it's sure not the government's business. But this has become a real issue in the military, and it's been a real object. And, and we have a lot of guys in Congress who not only are military, but they're very committed to religious liberties, and they understand original intent. And these are the guys that have been out there fighting and whacking away and pushing back the bureaucrats, pushing back the ACLUs, pushing back the secular, saying, look, you don't have a right to tell us what to say when we pray, and you don't even have a right to tell us if we can or can't pray. Right. And, and that's an issue. But see, under the new separation church and state, as opposed to the original, 
the new has given them all the club they need to go in and, and beat up people. As a matter of fact, we have cases that have gone to the U.S. Supreme Court over the Lutheran Church and the Catholic Church and whether they can be pro-life. They're saying that's a violation of separation church and state. It's not a violation of separation church and state for a church to take a position that the Bible takes a position on. But people say, yeah, but when you talk about the Bible being pro-life, that's a political position. You violated separation church and state. Well, even if that were true, there's a free speech clause of the Constitution. Right. So what's happened is the separation church and state phrase has trumped the free speech phrase. So if you exercise free speech as a religious individual in a public setting, if, if I were at school and exercised my free speech and said something religious, they'd say, your free speech doesn't count because separation church and state. When the court banned Bible reading from schools in 1963, on what possible grounds did it justify its decision? If you want to see why the court did what it did, simply read the case for yourself. You can find it online, or you can go to a local law library and read it. And if you do, you'll see that in reaching its decision, the lower court had relied on the testimony of a psychologist who explained the danger of reading the Bible in schools. The Supreme Court then repeated that finding, reporting, if portions of the New Testament were read without explanation, they could be and had been psychologically harmful to the child. That decision to remove the Bible from schools, just like the decision to ban voluntary prayer, was a reversal of all previous practice and rulings by the court on that issue. The court was simply announcing yet another new policy. In essence, it was just saying, the majority of the nine of us on the court don't want the Bible in schools anymore. For example, in 1967, a federal court declared a four-line nursery rhyme used by a K-5 kindergarten class to be unconstitutional. The court acknowledged that the word God did not appear anywhere in the nursery rhyme, yet the rhyme was still unconstitutional. Apparently, if someone were to hear the rhyme, he might think that it was talking about God, and that would be unconstitutional. This trend of hostility toward religious expressions continued in case after case, year after year. In fact, by 1980, the Supreme Court even addressed whether students could continue voluntarily to see the Ten Commandments while at school. The court acknowledged that the Ten Commandments in question were passive displays, just one of many pictures at school. That is, a student might see hanging on the wall a picture of George Washington, or a field of flowers, or a lighthouse on a seashore, or student artwork, or the Ten Commandments, or whatever. In fact, here is an original copy of the Ten Commandments that led to the Supreme Court case. They were not part of any curriculum. They passively hung on the wall, and like any other picture, a student could look at them if he wanted to, and if he didn't, he just walked on by. Nevertheless, the Supreme Court ruled that allowing students even voluntarily to see a copy of the Ten Commandments at school was unconstitutional. The Ten Commandments had to come down off the walls. Notice the court's explanation. If the posted copies of the Ten Commandments are to have any effect at all, it will be to induce the school children to read, meditate upon, perhaps to venerate and obey the commandments. This is not a permissible state objective. What a statement. We can't let students see the Ten Commandments. If they saw them, they might read them. And if they read them, they might respect them. They might even obey them. You know, things like don't steal and don't kill. That would be unconstitutional. What I loved is how you even got into all this, Dave. You were, you had looked up all the SATs, the SAT scores, and the prayers in school. It was just every day started out with prayer in school. That's right. And it was that simple prayer. And then after that, can you talk about that yeah, for a second? Yeah, what happened was you have the first public school law passed in America, 1647. And from 1647 for over three centuries, we had prayer at school, a regular part of what we did. But in 1962, the U.S. Supreme Court for the first time said, time to do something different. You know, since we reversed the meaning of separation church and state, that now means you can't have prayer at school anymore. Now, I've seen a lot of critics say, well, it's a good thing the court got involved because those poor kids were being forced to pray against their will. <laughs> That's absolute nonsense. The court itself said that that prayer that they struck down was voluntary and it was non-denominational. Matter of fact, that prayer was 
th there were four major religious groups that came together and said, you know, we all agree on God. And, and so you had the Orthodox Church, you had the Catholic, you had the Jewish, and you had the Protestants got together and came up with a 22-word prayer. And if you want to say it, fine. It's just a simple acknowledgement. It said, Almighty God, we acknowledge our dependence upon Thee. We beg Thy blessings on us, our parents, our teachers, our country. Simple, bland. Who's going to get offended at that? Well, somebody got offended. They weren't being forced to pray it. Nobody was being forced to pray it. The court said it is voluntary. It's non-denominational. Now, we hear from civil libertarians that the court stopped that coercive prayer. That's nonsense. If you look at every prayer decision the court has delivered since then, there's never been a case of coercion. It's always voluntary. As a matter of fact, in the 1985 case, Wallace versus Jaffrey, the court used that 62 case to say, oh, by the way, you can't even have silent prayer. You're going to wait a minute. And how do they know if I'm praying silently anyway? You know, I've always wondered what the enforcement mechanism is. But, but the court, it, this, is, this is such nonsense that they're saying it's even unconstitutional for you to voluntarily pray silently. Now, there's no coercion in silent prayer. Nobody can make you pray silently. So we have all these cases. We have the case out of Duncanville schools where you had 10 girls on the basketball team. They were all Christians. They wanted to pray. They got together and prayed. The court said, even though all of you want to pray, you can't do it. It's unconstitutional to have prayer at schools. I mean, these are people desiring to pray, and now you got the court saying, oh, no, all school prayer. So that's what happened in 62, 63, was the beginning of the end of any kind of prayer at schools, even if it's voluntary, even if 100% of the people want it, you can't do it. John Adams unequivocally declared, if thou shalt not covet and thou shalt not steal were not commandments of heaven, they must be made in Bible precepts in every society before it can be civilized or made free. This was the clear declaration of John Adams. And by the way, I think he'd qualify as an expert on the First Amendment. After all, he personally oversaw its framing in the U.S. Senate, and his signature is one of only two that appears at the bottom of the Bill of Rights and the First Amendment. And he forcefully asserts that the Ten Commandments must be fundamental precepts of our civil society. Founding Father James Wilson also affirmed the importance of divine law, such as the Ten Commandments. James Wilson was the distinguished Founding Father who served many years in Independence Hall, signing both the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, one of only six founders to sign both documents. He was then appointed by President George Washington as an original justice on the U.S. Supreme Court, where he served in the court for its first nine years, including when it met here in this room next door to Independence Hall. Significantly, James Wilson was the founder of the first organized legal training in America. In fact, these law books contain the lectures he delivered to law students here in Philadelphia while simultaneously serving here as a justice on the U.S. Supreme Court. These are really the first American law school textbooks. James Wilson, having helped write the Constitution and then taught students about it, we certainly know what is and is not constitutional. So did he think that divine laws, laws such as the Ten Commandments, must be kept out of public view? Here's what he clearly explained to students. Human law must rest its authority ultimately upon the authority of that law which is divine. Far from being rivals or enemies, religion and law are twin sisters, friends, and mutual assistants. James Wilson certainly did not believe that the Ten Commandments or divine law should be kept from public view, and many other founders made similarly explicit statements. Furthermore, early courts issued literally dozens of rulings citing from the Ten Commandments as a legal authority on numbers of diverse issues. In fact, so clear was the civil recognition of America's reliance on the Ten Commandments that for decades one was more likely to find a copy of the Ten Commandments hanging in a government building than in a religious one. Yet despite this lengthy history of reliance on the Ten Commandments, the court suddenly held that students could no longer see the teachings that are the basis of our laws. In modern politics, the term separation of church and state is most commonly used to ban acts of faith in the public arena. But a closer look into history reveals the intentions of this phrase to be just the opposite. How then has our history been redefined and rewritten. Discover our nation's godly history in the American Heritage Series. America, this is your heritage. The phrase separation of church and state, where did that come from? The first time in human history you got to go back into England in the 1500s, a theologian, Richard Hooker, 
was the one who used the phrase. He's one of the guys associated with the Reformation. In the Reformation, you've got a lot of the reformers teaching the concept of separation church and state. They're teaching, look, we've got to get the two institutions apart. This thing of having the church and state run each other, mm -hmm. uh, of having the church with the sword, and, uh, and of having the state decide what religious activities, not to be. Okay. So they were advocating institutional separation, but then Richard Hooker, theologian, is the first one who used the phrase separation of church and state. So since that time, the original phrase was used in what year? The original phrase was used back in the 1500s in England. Okay, 15, from 1530 to 1947, mm -hmm. it was consistent in its meaning? Consistent in its meaning. And, and then it changed in 1947. We, we have a completely new meaning. And today, Americans think that the current meaning is what it's always been. Okay, what so we that have. just means that we just have people in the wrong places. All the, the, that the government is filled with misinformed people that we have to change. Well, this is one of the things that, that we have, we continue to reteach this myth that, yeah. that goes again and again. It's in our textbooks. Yeah. We hear it every time a decision comes down from the Supreme Court because the court tells us that the founding fathers wanted separation church and state and therefore you, you can't have this religious activity. We, we hear it from the court. It's repeated when the press repeats the decisions of the court. You have a lot of secularists who repeat it on a regular basis mm -hmm. and you have very few Americans who know their own history. Quite frankly, we just don't know our own writings. At the same time they're making those decisions, Congress and Senate have paid chaplains That's right. on staff right now. What has happened, the way the, the way the court handles this dichotomy, because on the one hand you're saying it's unconstitutional to have these activities, but on the other hand you're saying, oh, wait a minute, these activities were put in by the guys who did the Constitution, so how can it be unconstitutional? So what they've come up with is a historical exclusion. It's what they call ceremonial deism. Ceremonial deism says, you know, in God we trust, we've had that on coins since back in the Civil War, and God we trust actually goes back to the National Anthem, the fourth stanza of the National Anthem back in 1813, 1814, Francis Scott Key wrote that. We've had that in America for 200 years, so how are we going to say that we can strike it down? Oh, I know. Here's what we'll say. We'll say nobody really believes it anymore. It's ceremonial deism, and therefore you can leave it in the coins, you can leave it on the money, because it doesn't mean anything to most people. Oh, I sure appreciate them telling me what I do and don't yeah, believe right, it, right, right. but that's how they excuse it. They say it's ceremonial deism. So things like that, um, uh, other little phrases that, that may appear with, with God in it, they say, oh, it, nobody really believes that. It's not theological. It, it's, it's been there for a long time. It's just historical. That's what they do with chaplains. They say, oh, chaplains have been there since the beginning. It's, you know, it's one of those historical traditions that's out there. It, it doesn't really bother people. People really don't listen to the prayers anyway. So if you want to have a chaplain, it's nonsense the way that they have to come up with exceptions right. to justify their lunacy in having flipped the First Amendment on its head. Returning to the 1962 decision that initiated the official hostility toward public religious expressions, the entire controversy had begun over a 22-word voluntary prayer that the court struck down in the Ingle Vital case. That little prayer, which led to the end of all school prayer and so many other public religious expressions, had simply stated, Almighty God, we acknowledge our dependence upon Thee, and we beg Thy blessings upon us, our parents, our teachers, and our country. That little voluntary prayer, which only acknowledged God and didn't even mention the word Jesus, was so bland that eight years later it was ascribed by a court as a, quote, to whom it may concern prayer. Now that's bland. That prayer acknowledged God only once. The same number of times that God is acknowledged in the Pledge of Allegiance and only one-fourth the number of times he's acknowledged in the Declaration of Independence. Yet somehow, that single voluntary acknowledgement was unconstitutional. Since this prayer had merely acknowledged God, the court even went so far as to investigate what percentage of the nation at that time did believe in God. The court reported that only 3% professed no belief in religion, no belief in God. Significantly, 97% of the nation did believe that 22-word prayer was consistent with the beliefs of nearly all the nation, yet the court said that it was unconstitutional for students even voluntarily to say what almost the entire nation believed. This was another first by the court, in addition to, one, having ignored the actual wording of the Constitution, two, having set aside precedent, and three, then having elevated an eight-word phrase from a private letter above the Constitution itself, the court, having no constitutional basis and nothing more than its own preference, now, four, sided with the 3% against the 97%.
This was the first time in America's history that 3% had become the majority. This decision initiated the current policy whereby the philosophy of the small dissident group, that is the 3%, becomes the standard by which the rest of the nation, that is the 97%, must conduct its public affairs. Religious individuals find themselves with less constitutional protection than secular individuals. Secular individuals have the right of free speech and the court has now ruled that secular faith is a religious faith guaranteed protection under the religion clauses. Now, if secularism, which is anti-religion, is a religion, then you've now said that anti-religion is a religion, and if you protect anti-religion under religion, you have just shot religion. There is no religious protection, and we have a number of rulings where the court has ruled that atheism is a religion. They've ruled that secular humanism, these are all religions without God, so how can you extend religious expressions, right. religious protections to people who don't have religious faith? That's where the court has taken us, and that's why now traditional religious people find themselves on the wrong end of nearly every issue. Uh, when it comes to where people are, it's real simple. You know, we've had for years a controversy over keeping under God in the pledge. Ninety percent of the people want it in the pledge. For decades, the court has said you can't have prayer schools. For decades, the numbers have been rising. It is now over 80 percent of the nation that wants prayer in schools. And by the way, find me anything else that 80 percent of the nation agrees wow. on. Yeah. You know, you, you can't. And so what happens is we hear from civil libertarians and critics that school prayer is divisive. No, the absence of school prayer is divisive. You got 80% of the nation that wants voluntary prayer to be available, that if you want to pray, you can pray. Well, it's the 20% that's running the 80%. It's the 10% that's running the 90%. Um, displays of the Ten Commandments that consistently runs between 70 and 80% of the nation wants public displays of the Ten Commandments. They don't win. It's the 20% that win because they say, we feel like outsiders when we see things like don't steal and don't kill. You know, th this, is, this is really nonsense. And original intent is so clear because now we can't have the Bible in schools, but founding fathers put the Bible in schools. Yeah. This is the guy who did the First Amendment language. Now I would think the guy who wrote the First Amendment language knows its intent. And he in here says, you can't let the Bible ever get pushed in the back of the classrooms in public schools. It's got to be our number one textbook. This is the guy, Benjamin Rush, who's called the father of public schools under the Constitution. He has a lengthy piece in here given a dozen reasons we'll never take the Bible out of public schools. Well, now we take it out because we say the Founding Fathers didn't want it. See, this is what happens when you don't know your history. It gets turned on its head, our policies get totally reversed, and that's been the case with separation of church and state. For more information on the American Heritage Series or to find books and other resources, visit wallbuilders.com. Through the American Heritage Series, renowned historian David Barton communicates our nation's forgotten, godly foundations and encourages us to once again view history through a truthful lens. For only when we recognize and embrace God's hand in our history can America become all that it was intended to be. Through Wall Builders, historian David Barton seeks to rebuild the walls of America's unique religious, moral, and constitutional heritage by educating the public and encouraging people of faith to become active in strengthening America's great foundations. For more information on how you can become involved, visit wallbuilders.com.